Okay, let's pray. Holy Spirit, we love you. Jesus, we love you. Father, we love you. Lord, I ask you that your presence will be so strong, and I ask you that for the time we have that we would really encounter you in a fresh way. I ask you that you would do something new inside of all of us. And most of all, I pray that you'd awaken us to the power of the gospel. Thank you for what it cost you, Jesus, to give us this gospel message, this message of love and reconciliation, what it cost you to give it to us. May we hold it with the reverence it deserves. We love you, we praise you, we give you all the glory. May every word be uh, pointed to you, that you be lifted up in this place. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your blood. We love you, Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. How long do we have? Might be a good, okay, cool. So let me start by saying this. For the, so what I'm going to try and do this evening, I know how many people weren't here this afternoon? Put your hands up. Okay, so quite a few of you guys. So what I would like to do, I'm going to try and cover uh, some of like uh, our Jesus at the door training. I'm going to bring some fresh things for those that were there. So you're getting some new stuff. And then some of the, uh, the, the kind of backbone of our teaching I'm going to touch on briefly, okay? But this is what was just coming to me. I like to let the Holy Spirit lead me, if you guys are cool with that, because I prefer that way. I, le I like to kind of flow. And so bear with me when I'm flowing. But I'm, I, like to, I like the Lord to lead me. It's more fun. So when I was praying, I just felt the Lord uh, remind me of a prayer that I've had for many, many, many years before I was an evangelist on paper. I had this prayer, and I still have it today. And this was my prayer. Lord, would you make me a neon sign that points to you. You see, when you look at neon signs, what happens is that they really catch your eye because they're flashing and they're, and they're all lit up. But if it's a neon sign that's in the shape of an arrow and it's pointing up, then what you're going to do is you're going to look at that sign and it's going to captivate you for a second and then you're going to see what it's pointing to. And my prayer has always been, as a disciple of Jesus, that, I, that he would make me an arrow that points to him. A neon sign that people would look at and they'd want to look, but then only for a split second because they'd want to see where my life was pointing. And I believe that what we're called to do as believers is to point to Jesus. And I'm going to tell you, the best way to point to him is for people to actually see you. Because if you stay indoors all the time, then they can't see you. So if we're going to be if we're going to be neon if we're going to light up the world if we're going to shine if we're going to make a difference and they're going to actually see us in order to see in order to see what we're pointing at then you know we have to leave from time to time that kind of makes sense yeah so if we kind of sit in church all the time you know we can be the best neon sign going but they ain't never going to see you and sometimes the simplicity can just kind of bypass us and the gospel is so simple, and what we're called to do as believers, uh, everybody, we're called to simply get out there, live your life, and be a, be a sign that points to Jesus. It's okay to shine, you know. Some people, they get a bit self-conscious, like, well, I, I don't know, it's not about me, brother. There's, there's nothing good in me. There is Jesus. And I'm going to tell you this. It's about all of him in all of you. If he didn't want you, then he, could have, he would not have created you. But he did create you because he loves you. And what he loves to do, he loves to put all of him and all of you and then display you like a neon sign that points back to him that people can encounter him. But we've got to get out there and shine. I believe every single one of you guys, I see it in you, bro. I see, God, I see the Spirit of God on you, man. I believe every single one of you guys is like a neon sign that shines for him. We've got to get out there. We're all called to share this gospel. Man, I fell in love with the gospel. And I'm forever changed. I didn't know it had the power until I stepped out with it. I used to kind of have a few other things that I would kind of use alongside the gospel just to kind of, just in case. You, you know, because that way that it would definitely kind of, you know, get them to a place where they're impacted. Until I was stripped of everything and I realized that all I had was the gospel. So I stepped out and, and the Lord changed the way that I did things. 
Um, we have a mission, uh, me and my wife, you know, we began this ministry by accident. We went onto the streets and, and decided to, we took a job offer that was a six-month trial position, fruit dependent. So I was in my place, I was in a nice comfy place, I was on the shoreline, I was looking at all the boats out in the, in the ocean, and then the Holy Spirit said, go out into the deep. And I was thinking, well, I can't really go out into the deep. I'll tell you what, Lord, if you give me more power, then I'll go out into the deep. But the Holy Spirit said, no, no, you go out into the deep and I'll give you more power. You see, faith is a muscle we're going to exercise. But it's also, it's impossible to please God without faith. And many of us, we like singing the songs and we like kind of, you know, uh, uh, loving each other and loving the Lord, which is incredible. But often he's saying, you know, I just want you to step out for me. Will you show me that you really believe it? Because you can sing all the songs you want. But when it comes down to it, are you going to step out in what you believe in your heart? Because, you know, talk is cheap. And so is singing. I'm just going to be honest. We need more than songs. Songs ain't going to change the world. What changes the world is when the believers who sing these songs get so filled and rem reminded about the cross and about our Savior who gave everything for us. Uh, when we sing these songs together here in, this, in these corporate events, we get so fired up and so stirred that we say, man, I've just got to go into the deep. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what they're going to do to me. I don't know what they're going to say. All I know is that I have to go. And that's when things begin to change. So that's what I did. I, I was employed to, to have this job as a full-time evangelist. You know, I didn't really know what, what particularly uh, what an evangelist was. All I knew is that I liked talking about Jesus. And then people kept telling me, you're an evangelist, brother. And I'm like, what's that? And they're like, someone who likes to talk about Jesus. And I'm like, that sounds about right, yeah. I like to talk about Jesus. I wasn't into titles. I didn't even know what things meant. All I knew is that I couldn't shut up about the one that I love. Now, it baffles me sometimes because, you know, we have, like earlier on I talked about basketball. Yeah, basketball's a big deal over here. Now, who, who's a basketball fan? It's not that big a deal in this area. Okay. Uh, American football. Football, you guys call it. Okay, all right. There's some sports fans. Okay. So, when you go, when you, let me, <laughs> there's got to be more basketball fans. What's your main sport here? What is it? Rugby. Do you guys play rugby? No way. You've stolen that from us. <laughs> Rugby's a big deal. I didn't know that. Okay, but what about uh, baseball? Baseball. baseball. Football. 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 What, as in like soccer? No. Oh, the American, fo American, we call it American football. Okay, football. Okay, <laughs> let's bring it back. Okay, so football. Football fans, we've got a few. Okay. When, when you want to talk to your, uh, your friends about football, you, okay, let, so let's say you want to go to the bar and you want to hang out with your friends, go to a pub. I, I know, okay, this is church, but, you know, for, for those that drink, a uh, wine or two. So you go, uh, or a beer for the fellas, you go and drink a beer with your friends in the bar. Now, this is kind of cultural. I come from Ireland. We like to drink, uh, but just for the tape, I don't. Uh, so, <laughs> so you go to the bar and you, you hang out with your friends, you have a couple of pints of Guinness or whatever it may be, okay, and then you talk about the football or the rugby, or the soccer, or whatever it may be. Now, for people who do those kind of things, I'm not saying you do, but for those that do, do they need a three-day extensive conference on talking about your favorite sport team before you're released into that situation, environment, to do a good job of telling them about it? No, you don't. It would be laughable. But somehow, we feel we need to have these big conferences where we, we learn how to talk about Jesus. Now, sometimes it's good, especially in this case. <laughs> I'm biased, I know. But sometimes we need these things, but not to the point, not to the degree of the way we do it. All you got to do is fall in love and let it spill out. You see, whatever fills you, spills out you. So let's just get filled again. Let's let Jesus so fill us that wherever we go, we're just spilling out everywhere. That's all we got to do, bringing it back to the basics, you know, bringing it back to the, the foot of the cross where you met him. Do you know the best evangelists I've ever seen in my life are the guys that I've led to the Lord and then trained them up. And I'm going to tell you why, because they can remember how it feels to be lost. So they don't have a problem. They've got so much compassion to approach a stranger. They don't care if the situation's not right. They don't care if somebody else is looking. Man, I was in the gym uh, about uh, five weeks ago. You're thinking, really? You need to go back, pal. 
So I was, it's my wife's cooking, sorry. But I was in the gym about five weeks ago and I'm in there and I walk in with my bag and I go and I, I sit that, put my bag down and there's a guy just come out the shower, out the uh, sauna. So he comes out the sauna, he's all sweaty and hairy and he's got his, uh, his uh, underpants on. Uh, I don't know what you call them. Boxer shorts, you guys call them that? Yeah, okay. Again, I know it's church, sorry. Uh, but I'm being real. So he's, he's here in his, unders, his underpants, his boxer shorts, yeah? So it's a little bit awkward because I want to share Jesus with him. <laughs> but, you know, probably society would say, well, that's not really the, the problem, or, or church would say, that's probably not the way you do it. But I'm thinking, well, I, well, I mean, this is the way it is. I'm just going to strike, you know, in my moment. So I'm, I go over to the guy and I'm like, hey, man, how you doing? And I, and I show him my picture on my phone of Jesus at the door. Now, as I'm doing that, again, he's like sweaty, hairy in his, in his undies. Uh, and, and there's another guy who's like looking like, what's this guy doing? So I've got to be honest, it's a little awkward. But awkward doesn't stop me. Because awkward is society telling you what you can do. Who says it's awkward anyway? This is how it becomes awkward because society says to you, we're going to put you, church, in a little box and we're going to put you on a shelf and we're going to allow you to come off on Sundays and special occasions, okay? But you can't talk in public. You must whisper if there's any other people around if you are sharing with somebody, okay? Because it's not something that you can really talk about because we don't allow it. Well, I don't believe in that because I believe the church leads the way. I believe we don't let, we don't let a secular society tell us what we can do and how we can do it. I believe from day one, the church, we make the rules. And society, they can come or they can stay, but this is where we're going. So I'm in the gym and I, and I just shared the gospel with my guy and it's awkward and this guy's looking at it and I just go through it and I lean on the Holy Spirit and I've got my hand on his sweaty, hairy shoulder as I'm praying for him uh, because, you know, I like to touch people's shoulders because I, I don't know, it's just a per I'm a tactile guy, what can I say? I like to show my love, you know? So I'm on there, I'm, I'm like, I've got my hand on his shoulder. This guy's like really like looking like, what are you doing? But, but I'm just in the zone anyway thinking, because I'm going to own this zone. You see, when I walk into a space, I don't, I'm not on the back foot saying, oh, maybe can I? Because you see, I believe that the earth and everything in it belongs to the Lord. So when I step into a zone, even if it's their zone, when I step in, it becomes my zone. Because I've got Jesus with me. So I'm not on the back foot ever. So I go in, I'm praying for him, and the Holy Spirit touches him. And this guy, as I'm praying for him, he goes, "Woo! well, I felt that, man. <laughs> this is what he says to me in the changing rooms. I'm like, that's the Holy Spirit, brother. He's like, whoa, Holy Spirit, come on. <laughs> this guy's really getting, really getting touched. So he gives his heart to Jesus. And we're hugging. And it was a little awkward because he's sweaty. But we're like kind of, you know, hugging, hug, hugging in the changing rooms. You know, one of those. And, and I walk off. Uh, I, I, I don't say, hey, hey, bro, I see you in heaven. Have a nice life. Because I want to make a disciple. How do I make a disciple? Well, I need to see the guy again. So I'm like, hey, give us your phone number, man. I, I want to invite you to my new believers group. It's on in a few days' time. Yeah, no problem. Gives me his phone number. His name was Tony. He began to come to my new believers group. But to get him there, he had no car. He had no job. So he was like, it was a big deal. He lived like 30 minutes away from me. So in order to get Tony to my new believers group, I'm going to do an hour, an hour round trip to get, just to get one guy there. Now, for me, I drive three hours for one guy because I love him. An hour is nothing for me. So I go for a few weeks and I'm bringing him and I'm getting him and I'm taking him home and I'm just doing it and doing whatever I've got to do just to help this guy get to know Jesus. We call him Big Toe. My kids love him. He comes to group church. But you know how it began? From walking into a moment that said, this is an awkward moment and just saying, hey, why not? I'm going to be a, a neon sign that points to Jesus even in this moment. I'm not going to worry about what he says. I'm not going to be worried about, worry about what he says. We've just got to be willing to step out. That is what the Lord wants from you. And the reason I have such a passion, uh, I don't believe I, I, I'm any different. I just honestly feel that when I got saved, uh, I saw the reality of eternity. That was what happened to me. I saw eternity, and I'm going I'm to tell you briefly what happened. I was 24 years of age. I was a heavy cocaine addict and, addict and alcoholic. I was mixing with gangsters in my, in my city where I was from, and they were giving me uh, I was, uh, large amounts of uh, copious amounts of uh, cocaine and drugs and, and stuff w was uh, floating around because these guys had a lot of money. Now, I decided that I would uh, begin to sample some of these drugs. 
because I was just in a place where I was at in life. So I began to take a lot of them. Fast forward a, a few years, and I'd began this love affair with cocaine that nearly killed me twice. This is the second time. I'm standing in a street, and what had happened is a, a gangster friend gave me $800 of pure cocaine. He said, here's a gift for you, Scott. So I had a friend at the time who was living with me. I said, hey, wake up, Stephen. This is party time. So we, I woke him up. We called a few friends and turned it into a party. We begin to rip through the drugs. Within about 30 minutes, my friend Stephen uh, begins to convulse uncontrollably on the ground, foaming at the mouth, and his eyes roll to the back of his head, and he gets taken away dead in an ambulance. I stood in the street... And as I'm watching the ambulance drive away, I could see in my horizon the, the, the do this doorway. And I knew it was hell. And suddenly, I'm on this treadmill, and I'm like moving towards the gates of hell. And I'm like shaking, I'm convulsing, I'm like, uh, I couldn't breathe. And I knew that I was moments from death. I knew it. And in this moment, you know, everything came into my, well, the thing that came into my head was, it doesn't matter what you, have, what you would have done in your life. In this moment, you're naked before your sin. And I knew in that moment that, that this was it for me. I was going to die. And I prayed, God, please keep me alive. Keep my friend Stephen alive and I'll turn to you. I tried to bargain. I tried to beg. I did whatever I could in order just to stay alive. We do that, We're human beings. Anything it takes, please just keep me alive. I'm going to tell you this. The, the precipice of eternity, it was a line to hell. And whenever I got right close by it, and I thought I'm going to cross it, it was as if somebody grabbed me by the neck and pulled me back. Somebody pulled me back enough. It was crazy. Somebody pulled me enough just to stop me crossing that line. And everything inside of me was fighting, and I was being drawn to this place of death and destruction and damnation. But there was somebody, there was something that was resisting and trying to pull me back and pull me back. In John chapter 6, verse 44, Jesus said this, Nobody can come to me unless the Father draws them. Now the Greek word for draw is a word called halkuo. It means to drag. And I'm going to tell you this, when I was on the precipice of eternity, this is how much my Savior loves me, that he was there and he had his hand around the scruff of my neck and he said, no, over my dead body, you ain't going anywhere. And he held me tight. And he pulled me and he kept me back. And he answered my prayer. My friend was discharged. He was resuscitated in the ambulance, discharged the next morning. That's the power of God. Now I'm going to tell you a beautiful story. After that happened, about six weeks after, not immediately, six weeks after I came to know Jesus, he brought me to him. When I realized that sin didn't taste the same anymore, I came to know the Lord. My friend who got discharged... I began to pray for him. He was still in the drug world. And I began to pray. His name's Stephen. I began to pray and pray and pray. And then I, came, I went to China to smuggle Bibles. And I got back and I turned on my phone. And it was Stephen. He said, hey, while you were in China, me, me and Lisa, me and my girlfriend, we got saved. Yeah. And I'm thinking, um, my initial thought, you know, you don't get this, me just being unholy. But my initial thought was, it's not real. I just, I just couldn't, you know, fathom it. He was steeped in sin. It was crazy. And then the Lord spoke to me and said, do you not think I can do this? Wow. And sure enough, him and his girlfriend, who became his wife, got saved that day while I was in China. Fast forward a few years. I've been on the streets of, of Ireland, of Northern Ireland, and, and I've been, you know, I've stepped out from the shallow into the deep, not knowing what I was doing. And, uh, you know, while me and Stephen were, while me and him were, were, were drug friends, while we used to live together in this drug-induced lifestyle, you know, there was times when we came very, uh, very, we came very poor because that lifestyle will do that to you. There's only so much back stealing and borrowing you can, you can do even when you've got gangster friends who are rich. So we ended up with no money at times. At times we had to siphon our petrol out of our car, you know, crazy things, man, just to get drugs. And I remember one of these times we decided to get a job. Go figure. But hey, so we thought, hey, let's get a job uh, and we'll get some money that way. Now, but we wanted it all fa the fast buck. You know what I mean? I'm not doing this month in hand business. You know, I work, you give me the money. So this guy was like, yeah, I've got a uh, sales, I'm a salesman and I sell uh, cosmetic products. Uh, if you work for one week, you get your money on the Friday. Come on the Monday, money on the Friday. Where do I sign? So me and Stephen, we go and we do this thing. Now, it was messy because, you know, we go in and we're like coming down off drugs, hungover, falling asleep at the table, all this kind of stuff. But he was, my friend, was a very good salesman. Stephen, really good. So I go in there. Now, I didn't even know what we were selling. 
I'm just following his lead. I'm like, yeah, whatever, where do I sign, you know? And I just sat there, answered the phone a few times, you know, looked like I knew what I was doing when the manager walked past. The rest of the time, just did nothing. So I was bad. So my friend Stephen, he became the top of the leaderboard in Tails. And guess who was bottom? So fast forward a few years, I'm on the streets, Holy Spirit downloads to me, Jesus at the door, framed around nine points in a picture. Holy Spirit gave me every single point in the harvest fields with an unbeliever. I'd stop an unbeliever, I'd begin to just talk, whatever I could about anything. I'd pray for them, pray for healing, and then talk. The Holy Spirit would say, there you go, say that. Hey, what about this? Just see them open up like a flower. Next thing, say this. And I wrote them all down, and it became what we now know as Jesus at the door, which is in many nations and many different languages. But it was born out of somebody stepping into the deep saying, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing, but please, will you, will you be with me and will you help me? That's how it was born. So fast forward a couple of years, uh, we'd seen a move of God in our community where thousands had come to the Lord. And my friend Stephen by now is a church planter. He's planted two churches. So he's at home and the Holy Spirit speaks to him and says, uh, get Scott to, uh, uh, bring Scott to, to your city and, uh, and let him train you in Jesus at the door. So Stephen is like, he's like watching the things on Facebook and seeing the things and he's like, nah, I'm not buying it. It's a, it's a, it looks like some kind of sales pitch. That's what he said. It's like some kind of sales pitch. I'm not buying it. So he's resisting the Lord. He's thinking, I don't know. And then God speaks to him. He says this. Don't you remember how bad a salesman Scott was? <laughs> he said, this is not sales. This is me. Invite him. So he invited me. And, I, and he was honest and told me, you know. And, uh, and I brought two of my new believers, two guys I'd led to the Lord, one from a very criminal background who got saved and, and another girl. Took, took two of them that I was discipling. Um, and this is what he said. He said, okay, here's the deal. Four days, we want you to go door to door around this whole estate. On day four, I'm going to plant a church. Excuse me? Yeah, you're going to do what you're going to do, what you say you do. And on the end of it, I'm going to plant a church. Because it's as fruitful as what you're saying, all the fruit I'm seeing in Ireland. Well, it'll be the same here, yeah? I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> so, so that's what we do, me and my guys. So I'm going to tell you a couple of stories of what happened. So this is what happened. We go and we go around the community and we begin to share. Now, there was no people area, town area. So he says, oh, no, you have to go door to door. And I'm like, well, hang on, hang on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't read this in the small print. I don't do door to door. That's a Jehovah's Witness Mormon thing. <laughs> you see, I'd never done door to door in my life. I I'm like, does the Holy Spirit even work door to door? I didn't really. I knew. So he's like, you've got to go door to door. And I'm like, well, I don't, really? Is that the only way we can do it? He's like, yeah. So what do we do? We go door to door. First time in my life doing door to door ever, let alone with Jesus at the door, at the door. So we go around, we're knocking all these doors. And, and something wonderful happened. The same things that happened to people's hearts on the streets happened at the doors. Go figure. That's the power of the gospel. So we knock on this one door and, and, you know, there's all people in different churches training. We go to this one door. It's the door facing the, the hut that it rented to plant a church in. It's like a scout. We have scouts. I don't know if you guys have that. It's like a scout hut. He rented it, hired it to plant the church there. So we knock on the door facing the hut. This lady answers the door. I'm like, hey, excuse me. You ever see this picture? Do you ever pray? No, I don't pray. I'm not interested. So she goes to shut the door. As she goes to shut the door, this big dude steps out. He's going, what's going on? So I'm thinking, okay, this is going to go two ways. <laughs> One, he's going to get saved, or two, he's going to give me a hard time. So he, I said, this is Jesus knocking at the door of your heart. Do you ever pray? He's like, sometimes. He's like, do you want to come in? I'm like, yeah, I'd love to. So we go in. We step in his living room, and we begin to share the gospel as his kind of girlfriend's like looking like, why are you even letting these people in my house? I was going to shut the door on the face. So we're in there. We share the gospel. He gets saved. Nigel, his name was. He gets saved. He goes to work the next day. He's a builder. Now, while he's in work, what's he doing? He's telling all his building friends about Jesus. He's telling them, hey, these, these guys came to my home last night. I prayed to accept Jesus. And they're laughing at him. Just laughing at him. But he doesn't care. So then he comes back to our mission the next night and the next night. Two nights in, he brings the, his uh, girlfriend who was going to shut the door. I'm like, okay, here we go. I was preaching that night. So I preached, and I got to lead it to the Lord. Yeah. This couple, the pastor married this couple, and he became the pastor's right-hand man when he planted his church. 
We began to see incredible things. I trained a group of guys, and I want to tell you this for those who are nervous. If I said, okay, hit the streets right now, we're going to talk about Jesus. Who feels slightly nervous? Be honest. Be more honest. You're in church, you can't lie. So you go out and you share. So I train all these people, and we go. Now, as I'm looking around the room, I see two individuals, one here, one here, and I'm thinking, whoa, those guys are making me nervous by how nervous they look. <laughs> Have you ever been around somebody who's like super like awkward, socially awkward, uh, and they're kind of, you know, you're talking to them and they're like, like doing funny things, and it kind of it rubs off on you, and you start doing funny things. <laughs> It kind of like has an effect on you, you know? Just like if you were the super confident person, they make you feel at ease and relaxed and, and you're like, yeah, you feel really good. So it's kind of like that. So these guys were like, they were like making me nervous. And they're like, they're like white as sheets. They're like knee knocking, <laughs> pasty looking, scared of their own shadow type individuals. One there, one there. I'm thinking as long as they, do, I'm, in my head I'm like, as long as them two, those two don't become partners. When we hit the streets, we're all good. So we pair everybody up. I'm doing what I'm doing. The pastor's pairing them up. I turn around. We, we walk out the front door, and I turn around. Who's together? The two Johns. They're both called John. Now, this is what made it really bad. You see, when people are, are afraid, they're like magnets pulled together. The fear just, just locks you together. So the two of them like found solace in each other's fear. And they were like rubbing shoulders with each other. I'm like, come on, yeah, yeah. You know, hiding down, crouched. I'm thinking, this is going to be a disaster. But it was too late to, to change. So this is what happens, true story. The two Johns go to, a, uh, go to the worst community, uh, worst area in the whole community. Not only the worst area, the worst street in the whole community. They knock on the front door. First time doing it. They got the card in the hand. Okay, let's do this. Come on, you ready? Yeah. They knock on the front door. Guy answers the door. What do you want? We want to talk about Jesus. And Listen, listen. I can't be seen to be talking to you two. I've got a reputation in this street, man. The guy's got a scar from here to here. He's like, what is the, what do you want to tell me? Jesus. You know, these guys are like, man, they're just, you know, they never signed up for this. So the guy's like, the guy's like making sure nobody's looking. He's like, okay, come on in. So, so they step in, they step into the little front porch area, and then he's like, uh, uh, listen, before you carry on, I better, I better be honest with you guys. Now, I have warrants out for my arrest. The police are looking for me because I've kidnapped and tortured people. Sorry? So the two Johns get a little closer. And as you can imagine, they're a little nervous. And the guy's a gangster, a very intimidating looking guy called Ricky. So he explains to them, he says, just being honest, I've got warrants out for my arrest. I'll tell you what, go in my living room and wait for me. I'll put the kettle on, we'll have a brew, cup of tea in UK language. <laughs> go and sit down in there, I'll come back with the tea. So Ricky goes and he makes the tea. Two Johns are there by the front door. One of them says this, okay, let's make a run for it. <laughs> let's go. Come on, while he's in there, he won't see us. Let's go, there's the door, come on, go. And the other John says this, no, I can't run. I have to know that I did it just once. We have to give God that much. Yeah. So he stood his ground. And they go into the, the lion's den. And they await their destiny. The man comes back with a couple of cups of tea. He says, okay, what do you want? He says, can I, can I read? To this, he says, well, yeah, if you want. So he just stands there through trembling hand with his head bowed low, reads this card. The young gangster says, I'd like to let him in. <laughs> Excuse me? He's thinking, I must have said it wrong. I better do it again. Okay. <laughs> la, 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 la. Yeah, I want to let him in. Yeah, I, I would let him in, yeah. Now, we'd only just got our card, it was like new, so we had no prayer on it at this time, you know, and he'd never led anyone to the Lord. So he just kind of fumbled his way through, you know, you know Jesus, I, I believe in you, uh, I want to uh, let you in, uh, thank you very much, uh, amen. <laughs> just kind of fumbled his way through, through whatever he could think of. All he's thinking is, get me out of here, <laughs> while I'm, my body's intact, with all my limbs intact. So he, he gives him the church flyer, that's it, no, no, like what I train, get your details, none of that. He's just like, here you go, thank you, bye. And, th and they're out of there. 
The two Johns, they leave. Now, they only go to one house because they were just so ecstatic, you know. I remember hearing about Reinhard Bonnke when he was 15 years of age, you read in his book, he said he went for the first time to the streets of Germany and he sang and he shared the gospel and one man got saved. He ran home to his dad saying, it works, it works. That was like the two Johns. They tried it and it worked. This gospel works. And you know what happened? This is what happened. The next day, Ricky wakes up. He starts smoking on his crack pipe because that's what he's always done. But as he's smoking his crack pipe, he realizes this, this kind of revelation. Hang on, man, I'm not getting high. So he smokes a bit more. I ain't getting high. So he puts the crack pipe down and he picks up a bottle of, a bottle of vodka. As he starts drinking the vodka, he just brings it back up. He's like, what is going on? And then he remembers. The two, knee knocking, pasty looking, scared of their own shadows, individuals with the shaky picture, and he begins to smile as he remembers that he let Jesus in. And it was as if the Lord had put a blocker on his body from sinning. So what what does he do? He's standing there and he's remembering, then all of a sudden, beep, beep, the horn goes outside, it's his gangster friends, two of them. He gets in the car, they're driving down the road, and the police pull him over, the cops pull him over. So the cops come over, and there's three of them, and the cops come over and say, okay, name, address, all your details. First one gives it, next one, name, address, da, da, da. Gets to Ricky. Ricky freezes. Now, Ricky's a career criminal. He's got every little detail to pat. He could have easily given it. But as he pauses, he hears a voice. Tell the truth. Tell the truth, he heard a voice. So he pauses and the officer's looking at him. He says, okay, what is it? So Ricky, he tells the truth. And he waits for the policeman to radio it through. And he waits to be arrested, knowing that he's going to be incarcerated, knowing that his past is going to catch up with him. What happens? The policeman comes back. Yeah, you can go. You can go. And you can go. Ricky said, excuse me, officer. I can go? Are you, are you for real? He said, yeah, we got nothing on you. This is what Ricky did. You know what he did? He left his gangster friends in the middle of the street. He says, I'm out of here. He came straight to our scout hut. He walked through the doors and said, hey, who's in charge here? Jesus just wiped away my past. Jesus just wiped away my past. I'm going to tell you this. It didn't happen through Todd White, Reinhard Bonnke, or anyone else, apart from the two Johns. Because that is the power of the gospel. It is not about you. It is about who lives within you. It is about the message that you proclaim. It is about Jesus. Always about Jesus. It will always be about Jesus. It will never stop being about Jesus. And Jesus will move through a vessel that gives him permission. It don't matter how nervous you are. It don't matter how scared you are. All that matters is that will you apply your B.O. to G.O.? Will you move forward or not? If you move forward, miracles will happen, I promise you. Will you stand your ground and say, I I, I can't go. I've got to see it through once. I've got to give God that much. So I'm standing there. I was privileged enough to hear it first hand from Ricky's mouth. I'm standing there as he comes in, and I'm there with two pastors, my friend and the the other pastor, and he tells this story. And imagine we just stood there. There was this gangster, crazy scar, crazy guy, telling us his life story and telling us what happened uh, 24 hours ago. Man, we were like blown away. Now, as, as this is going on, over here is John. Now, roles reverse because he's making the tea for Ricky this time. And he's over here, and he's making the tea, and he's looking. And I catch his eye. As, as Ricky's telling me this story, I look, and I see him, and he's glowing like a kid on Christmas Day. He's lit up like a Christmas tree. You know why? Because he's saying, I did that. Because I stood my ground. Because I didn't run away. That's what happened. I did it. And I knew in that moment that our ministry would be built on finding the Johns in the church. We call it awakening the secret army. Because I'm going to tell you this. Every man, woman, and child that the devil is dismissed. 
Those ones the devil laughs at, he'll never amount to anything. She'll never do anything. Keep making the tea. Keep sweeping up. Keep just doing the PowerPoint. That's where you belong. All those people he's counted out, well, we're coming for you. And we're going to say, hey, here's the gospel. You never prayed for the sick? Don't matter. You never heard a word from the Lord? It don't matter. Because I'm going to tell you this, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And that's all you need. And you don't know what to say? It don't matter. Here you go. It's written down. Just read it. And we're on a mission to awaken the secret army. And I'm telling you, it's happening. So John was standing there and I saw him and I knew, I knew that that was what we would be about. Now I'm going to tell you something incredible about that John. Three years previous, he was in a psychiatric hospital, lost his marbles, lost his mind, went crazy. He lived in a padded cell, and the Holy Spirit met him in that place and rescued him. So he had a lot that he was dealing with. But if John can do it, then you can do it. Nobody's without excuse anymore. Because you have a power behind you, and you have a power within you, that he says, if you go then I'll give you what you need. If you go, I'll give you more power. But we stay on the sidelines and we stay on our conferences and our churches and we're like, okay, God, give me more love, more power. Keep on flowing it. Keep flowing it. Come on, I need some more. Just keep filling me up. Keep filling me up. And we don't do anything. But I'm going to tell you this. When you just step out with whatever mustard seed of faith you have, And you say, okay, I'm going to go for you. I'm scared. I don't know what's going to happen. Then he's going to give you so much power. You won't know what to do with it. It's the truth. And the gospel that we hold has the power to change lives. And I've seen it so many times. So evangelism, what it is, is partnership. The great commission wasn't called the great mission. It's a co-mission. Because the the Holy Spirit is offering you an invitation and he's saying, hey, I want you to partner with me. Doesn't matter how old you are. Some of you younger guys here. There's no junior Holy Spirit. It's the same deal. And he's extending an invitation to you saying, hey, will you go with me? When you're in school, when you're in the classroom, uh, maybe your friends might laugh at you. But he's saying, you just go for me and watch what's going to happen. I'll silence the haters. I'll move in such a way that that they they won't even know what hit them. For those who saw Finger of God 2 in this, in this house that sh- showed the movie, showed me in a bar in Northern Ireland. But what it didn't do was tell the backstory. You see, when I went to, Northern, when I went to that bar, there was a backstory. And I'm just going to briefly tell you. This is the backstory. I was uh, suffering with post-traumatic stress disorder. I had PTSD because of my two near-death experiences before I got saved. I was in a mess. I was on medication. I was on panic attacks every single day. Couldn't leave my house. Man, I was in a mess. While I was in that place... The Holy Spirit showed me a vision. I was just painting my house, my, my room. Not even willingly. My wife was like, you better paint that. You better paint that room. I'll do it next week, love. No, you better do You know, one of those. So eventually I decided to give in to, for the sake of my, you know, happy wife, happy life. So I'm painting my room. And what happens? The Holy Spirit intervenes in my just mundane, everyday chore. And he shows me a vision, me outside the bar sharing the gospel. You know what I began to do? I began to tremble like a coward because I was so feeble and frail in myself. I had nothing to offer. I can't go and face these kind of people. But let me tell you, there is something sweet to the Lord about weakness because his strength is personified in your weakness. So there are some weak vessels and the Lord's like, I don't care because I'm going to put all of my strength inside of you. And through you, I can change the world. Because there's not, there's, there's not too much of you to get in my way. So he showed me this vision. And I'm like, man, I can't do that, God. And I'm trembling and I'm scared. And I don't know what to do. And the Lord's like, go. And I'm like, I can't go. So it took me about nine months to go. Now, I've got to be honest. Because of uh, a lot of it, because of my physical state. I, you know, I was getting panic attacks just like leaving the house, man. It was crazy. I'm like, I can't stand. The people that drink in this bar are killers. IRA type guys, balaclavas, kick your door down, shoot you. That's the kind of people that drink there. Known killers, gangsters, uh, uh, all kinds of crazy stuff. Bank robbers, man, I'm not kidding. So I didn't want to go there. But you see, Jesus, he wanted to go there. Because he loves those people. And you know what? Because he loves you so much that he wants you to partner with him. It's called the Great Commission. 
He doesn't need us, but he chooses us. Every single one of us, no matter how weak, frail, or scared, he says, I want to go there, and I want you to come with me. Because I don't want you missing out on this. This is going to be something for the books. This is going to be something special. And I want you to be part of it with me. So eventually, after nine months and meeting a big bald guy called Robbie Dawkins, who has the power to change uh, people's perspectives, if you've ever met Robbie, he prayed for me. And he said, go and do what God's telling you to do. You're bulletproof. Two hours after meeting Robbie, he came to visit my church. The morning, I said to the Lord, you need to confirm it and I'll go. I went and I stood outside this bar with a speaker, pressed play, pointed the speaker towards the doors, and then just kind of waited to see what would happen. People came out, what are you doing? I have no idea. Uh, Can I just talk to you about Jesus? No, I'm not interested. Somebody else came out, hey, can I talk to you about Jesus? Yeah, what is it? I get to pray for him. That's how it began. And I just went and went faithfully every week. By week number two, this is what happened. The bar owner comes out, six foot four, notorious individual in this community, which you'd have to be to run a bar like that. I'm there with my music, week two, I'm like, okay, I'm back, come on, we can do this. Now, I I felt like I'd conquered a giant already just doing week one. So I'm back in week two, and I'm there, and I'm there 10 minutes in, and I'm just kind of just, you know, chatting with people, praying for folks. Out he comes, six foot four, this big dude, scary looking dude. He's like, what are you doing outside my bar, boy? I'm like, well, I, I'm just kind of here, here. Shut up. Listen to me. People don't come here. Nobody's welcome around here. What are you doing here? Well, I, I, I want to tell you about Jesus and, and stuff. No, no, listen, you're not listening to me. And he gets in my face and he puts his head against my head and he's screaming threats. I'm going to kill you. Turn that effing music off right now. And then the last thing he says is this. Why are you here? And you know what I said? Jesus sent me. As I said, Jesus, he went. And he's pacing up and down. All I said was the name above every other name. That's all I said. One word. Jesus sent me. It was like some force knocked him back. And he's pacing up and down and up and down. And he's like, and his friend's trying to calm him down. Leave it alone. Leave it, leave it. And he's, like, and he's going crazy. So I'm trying now, now all the while, does the Lord not forget, you know, I'm in, I'm in a PTSD kind of vibe thing going on. That's, you know, people, PTSD type people, you know what they're meant to do? They're meant to go and listen to dolphin noises. <laughs> they're meant to go on country walks. They're meant to sit by the ocean and they're meant to put seashells to their ears, you know, whatever. Those kind of things, man, you're meant to be relaxing. You're meant to be having like acupuncture and and massaged and all these kind of things. No, not the Lord. Not when you're in the Lord's army. He says, no, 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 that's the flesh. I'm talking to your spirit. You go. Your flesh is weak. Forget that. But your spirit's willing. I know it is. So I'm standing there, and he goes into the bar next door, and I'm trying to compose myself. My heart's going crazy. I'm like, whew, trying to breathe and everything. Five minutes go by. I'm like, okay, maybe he's gone. He sticks his head out the bar. He says, you in here now. So I stand there, and I'm thinking, okay, what do I do, man? I've come this far. Let's go out in the blaze of glory. So I... <laughs> I walk in the bar and I literally, I could envision it, that they're all going to jump on me, they're going to beat me up, all this kind of stuff. And I, I'm there and he's there, he sat there at a table with a drink. He says, I want to buy you a drink. <laughs> so I'm kind of thinking, you know, is there a catch? Making sure there's no one, you know, behind me. Uh, yeah, I just take a Coke, yeah? Okay. Answer me a question. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Are you happy? I'm thinking, does he mean right now? <laughs> uh, yeah, man, I, I, I'm happy. Yeah, yeah, Jesus makes me happy. He says, I'm not. And I began to share the gospel with him. You know what the Lord did? He gave me favor. I go back the next week, and it is like the Red Sea's parting. All these guys, thugs, killers, crazy people, they're all there. The week before, they were giving me lots of uh, hand gestures, you know, <laughs> Uh, it's kind of like they had like arthritis in their fingers or something, but they were doing all kinds of signs. But this week I go back and they're like, the Red Sea's parting and they move up the way and I just keep walking 
I'm walking and they keep moving and keep moving until I get to the back and there's my new friend, the bar owner. Scott gets up, he's playing poker with his boys. He says, good to see you, brother. Come on over, let me get you a drink. And he takes me over to the bar. Everything had changed. Do you know why? Because the Lord had given me favor and because I conquered a giant, but I didn't do it through the sword. I did it through the cross. You see, the days are gone. The David and Goliath days are gone. But we've got to physically knock people down. David knocked his giant down with a stone. Physical force. I'm going to tell you this. The cross is the only power we need. The cross is power enough to lay the, grit, the, the biggest giant down on his back. The love of the cross can slay the biggest giant. And I saw it. Me and this guy became friends. Went out walking our dogs together. Came to church with his wife. God did incredible things, and we're still friends. And I said, hey, I want to I wanna bring my church to your bar. I'm thinking, hey, let's push it a bit. You know, I've got, I've got my foot in the door. Let's go. He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, you know, I want to literally bring, I, I want to have a meeting in your bar with all your punters, and we're going to talk about Jesus. He's like, okay, Scott, no problem. <laughs> so I go to my worship team. Hey, who fancies a gig? Who would like to do a show? Yeah, yeah, where is it? I tell him the forge bar, oh, no, 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 I can't make it that week. I'm busy and those kind of things, you know, as you can imagine. So we go and we do like four nights in that bar and God does the miraculous. It's incredible. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. First night we go, Halloween. They're all dressed up like witches as if we weren't scared enough. <laughs> People running around, in your face trying to scare because they knew who the Christians were. The guy, you see, because he didn't know, because I don't drink, and my, the only Christian reference he had was me, so he's like, well, Christians mustn't drink. So he went out and bought us 20 sausage suppers. This is sausage and chips and those kind of stuff. He thought Christians don't drink, but they probably eat. So he laid out on the pool table 20 m meals because he didn't think Christians drank. So we're in there, and, and there's a guy, and he stood at the front of the bar, and he's like, what you looking at, boy, to me? I'm like, I'm not looking at nothing, man. He's like, I said, what are you looking at? I said, no, no, I'm not looking at anything. We're just getting ready for the first night. I'm like, no, nothing, man, no. He's like, are you looking at me? And he comes over, and, and in that place, you've got to be careful who you, you uh, engage with. So I said, look, I don't know trouble. He says, well, you're going to get trouble. So anyway, I backed off, and I went over to, to my bar owner friend. I said, look, I don't want to cause any trouble, but there's a guy over there. Where is he? <laughs> so he goes over, and I'm like, look, I don't want to cause any trouble. He, he was just getting a bit in my face. He's like, who, who is it? I said, well, it's that guy over there. I didn't want to point because in case he saw me. So he goes over like this, grabs him by the throat and lifts him up. I said, not him, the other guy. <laughs> he got, he got the, so he goes, grabs this guy by the throat and throws him out the bar. This is how it began. So we're in that bar, we're, share, we're singing, we're praising, and we're sharing the gospel. And I'm like, Holy Spirit, move like a wind in this place. Yeah. Let him feel a tangible wind. And as I stand there, there's a wind goes past, gets about here, ladies at the bar with a, a glass of whiskey, she stood there, the, feel, the tangible like wind, the wave of the presence, she goes, Whoa, I can feel it, I can feel it, comes up to the front, to me at the front, what is it, what is it, I can feel it, and she's crying and crying, I'm like, that's Jesus, this is in front of the whole bar, I'm like, that's Jesus, do you want him, she's like, yes, I do, I want him, gives her heart to the Lord, her name was Bella. The following week, she's at my new believers group. But I'm going to tell you this. What happened? She tells me this after. She says, this is crazy. I was at a bar six miles away. And I'm at the bar drinking like I always do. And somebody says, hey, did you hear there's a Christian night in the Forge Bar? She's like, no way. I don't believe you. She got a taxi to the bar to see if they were lying. And ends up getting saved. <laughs> Incredible. So I want to tell you this, that there are some giants in your community and the Lord's looking for some shepherd boys and shepherd girls. You see, when David, when he came to the forefront, they just laughed at him. His brothers laughed at him. What are you doing here, shepherd boy? Get back with your sheep. You don't belong here. This is the place where warriors stand. This is for the men of valor. We're, we're in battle. You don't belong here. You look like a shepherd and you smell like a shepherd. Get back. But you see, all these brave men of valor, there was something that was different between them and David. I'm going to tell you what was different. is they, they felt like they had it all together. But then when the voice came, 
the voice of the giant. Like scared little boys, they cowered in the corner looking through the cracks in the things. But when the shepherd boy heard that voice, when he heard the sacrilegious scoffing of Goliath, an indignation rose up inside of him and he said, no, I will not stand for that. But they laughed at him. What are you going to do, boy? And you know the rest of the story. David, the young shepherd boy, he stood against that giant. Do you know why? Because he knew the same God that was with him with the lions and bears would be with him with that giant. So what did he do? He stepped out in faith. Did he have it all together before? No. But he said, I'm going to go and your power is going to go with me. So he stepped into the deep and he said, Lord, I'm doing this for you. I want to honor your name. How dare he come against the armies of the living God? And he stood and with, the sl with one stone changed his life. I believe it took about 20 seconds for David to stand face to face with a, with, with a giant, a man-eating giant. Goliath said, well, how dare you come at me with sticks, you little dog? And David came back. How dare you come against the armies of the living God? Today the birds will feast on your flesh. And they had this dialogue for about 20 seconds. And then it was game over. Goliath was gone. And that one act, 20 second act, changed David's life forever. He married the king's daughter, became the most famous man that was ever known. They wrote songs about him. Never paid taxes again. Changed his life. <laughs> We'd like that one. Changed his life. One 20 second act can change your life. And I'm going to tell you how it happens. It happens in the mundane, in the everyday, doing a chore, just doing a delivery, just kind of keeping uh, somebody happy, just loving somebody, just helping somebody out, just serving. And then the opportunity for promotion comes. And you hear the voice. And you have a decision. Do you take it? Or do you walk away? Do you... Do you leave? Do you walk out the door? Or do you stand your ground and say, I'm going to give God just once. I'm going to give this. I'm going to do it just once for God. It's your choice. There's a great movie called We Bought a Zoo with Benjamin and me. You've seen it. It's a great film. A true story about this guy whose wife dies and leaves him this money and he buys a zoo. This is what Benjamin and me said. He said, 20 seconds of embarrassing bravery. 20 seconds of insane courage can change your life. Just 20 seconds. That's all. I believe the Lord would ask some of you guys tonight, will you give me 20 seconds? When you're at school and when someone's laughing at you or when there's someone who's bullying someone, would you give me 20 seconds? When you're at work and you feel the nudge to share the gospel, when there's something going on in your community, will you give me 20 seconds? Because you may look good on the outside, but he doesn't care about that. He's like, come to me in weakness and I'll put my power inside of you. Now Jesus at the door as a tool, it may seem feeble and it may seem weak without the Holy Spirit. But I promise you, this thing is God breathed. And if you step out in it, all you gotta do is read it. When I went to Oklahoma for the first time ministering in the US, an 11 year old girl came to my training, her name was Isabel. And she sat in my train in timid, shy girl. And I'm thinking, why is she here? She steps into the streets and she just reads the thing. She reads it. You know what happens? The lady bursts out crying and gets saved. The gospel is power enough. We don't need anything but the gospel. But we have been, been given things. You can pray for healing. You can get words of knowledge. But that is not the gospel. A word or a healing won't change somebody's life but meeting Jesus well. I've discipled thousands of people, uh, led thousands of people to the Lord. I'm going to tell you this. Not one of those people were, was saved through a sign or wonder. Everyone through a simple gospel message. Now I'm totally, I'm down with signs and wonders. I've seen many healings. I pray for the sick. I've seen all that stuff. But what I've began to realize along my journey is this, is that the simple gospel has the power to change people's lives. And I've also realized this, that everything else we've been given is in order to help us, to point us towards invitation for the gospel. It's all sowing in order to reap. That's why we've been given what we've been given. So I want to tell you this story and then, and then we'll start rounding up. But I want you guys to know this, that you are the light of the world. It's who you are, every single one of you guys. It doesn't matter if you're shy, you're not good around people, you're nervous, people pick on you at school. 
you got PTSD, you're a shepherd. Your name is John and your knees knock. Makes no difference. You are the light of the world, like a light in the hill. And when you walk into a room, people are going to look at you. I'm telling you. And you're going to think, man, I'm looking good today. But they're looking at you because they see something in you. They see that you are the light of the world. We read a story in Luke chapter 19, verse 1 to 9, about a little man called Zacchaeus. And what Zacchaeus did, he climbed a tree because he wanted to see. But it was so much more than that. You see, what Zacchaeus did, he wanted, he was compelled to be close to Jesus. I rem- have you ever been compelled? I remember when I went to, uh, I was just telling Grace earlier on about how I met my wife. You know, when I went to Bible college, the Lord told me that that's your wife. So I'm like, I'm down with that. Where do I sign? It's a good deal for me, believe me. <laughs> Married up, you know. So I'm like, I'm happy with this deal. What do I do? So I began to pursue her, and she began to kind of uh, uh, reject me. Wasn't really what I was thinking. Um, but anyway, I carried on. I'm persistent. What can I say? So they take a, the photograph of all the co- Bible college students, and they put it in the reception area. And you can look at it and decide if you want to buy it. So they put it down there, and what do I do? I go, this is what I do. I go, true story, and I uh, make sure nobody's looking. I look at the however many, 800 students. I pick out my to-be girl. I, I find her in the picture, and I say this. You will be mine. <laughs> <coughs> you will be mine. Man, I was that compelled. I'm not kidding. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I was like infatuated with this girl. Whatever she has, whoever she is, like there was nothing she could do wrong. Like even the way she walked, I'm like, oh, Lord, Lord and mama. Lord. I'm like the way she walked, the way she talked, and it was just everything about this woman. She just had me captivated. I was compelled. And when you're compelled, you can't do anything but be close to that person. And when Zacchaeus climbed the tree, he wasn't having a 15-minute tax collector's lunch break. He wasn't a kid that never grew up and liked climbing trees. What happened is this. He was compelled because you see the light of the world was walking down the streets of Jericho. And when you're living in darkness and you've never seen a light like that, you've got to be close to it. And he's he's going round and round in his daily life doing the same things. And the Holy Spirit showed me an image of a school of fish, pack of fish going round and round, deep dark ocean. Suddenly, spotlight comes on. All the fish, instantaneously turn to look at the light. And the Lord says, it's because they've never seen anything like it before. When Jesus walks down the street, you've never seen anything like it before. Because you're going round and round and round the deep, dark ocean of life. But not just Jesus. Do you know why? Because he said, you're the light of the world. 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 How do I know it to be true? I was with my brother. He's not walking with Jesus yet. We go to uh, Liverpool City Centre, where I'm originally from. I had a day off. I take my brother shopping. We do a little shopping. We go into a store. Now, uh, Liverpool's a huge city. It's a shopping city. Thousands of people, thousands upon thousands, I'm not exaggerating, just all day to shop because we like our fashion. That's all people do, yeah? So I'm there with my brother. We go into a store. We buy two hats. I get no bag, no receipt, and I walk out past the security guards, and I say to my brother, better be careful. They're probably trying to arrest us, thinking we've stolen the hats, you know, kind of laughing. A <laughs> couple of hundred yards down, we get down the street. I turn around. I notice there's a guy, security guard, bounding towards me. He's, like, marching towards me, sunglasses and a suit on. I'm like, I'm starting to feel guilty for something I haven't even done. <laughs> so the guy comes over. He's like, hey, you. I'm like, what, what do you mean? He says, you. You, I need to talk to you. I'm like, yeah, what's the problem? He says, can you get me some cocaine? I said, excuse me, what's that, man? He's like, can you get me some cocaine? Can you get me some drugs? I'm like, is this a joke? He's like, no, I'm serious. I'm like, aren't you a security guard? He's like, yeah, I am from that store over there. I'm on my lunch break and I want some cocaine. You look like a guy who can get me some. (laughs) So I'm kind of like thinking, hang on, is it, you know, is this for real? And then I realized, I'm the light of the world. You see, he could have stopped any one of those thousands that are milling about. He could have even stopped my brother, but he didn't. He came straight to the light because he was being compelled. And he came over to me and I said, no, 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 it's not cocaine, man. You ever see this picture before? Did you ever pray? And I shared the gospel with him through a two-minute tool with nine points. He got born again in front of me and my brother. My brother was like, this has got to be a setup. He's just like textbook. And my brother's like, no. And the guy's called Mike. He 
He stood on that street, prayed to accept Jesus. He came looking for cocaine and left with Jesus. Do you know why? Because I'm the light of the world. And that's the power of the gospel. So I want to encourage you guys. I don't know where you're at and you're all in different places, but I want to tell you this. The gospel is enough and you are enough. If you will only own it. Because right now God is stirring some of you guys and he's saying your community depends on this. There are people that are waiting for you. I'm telling you. The people that are waiting, people's lives that are going to be changed because of what you're going to do or not. He won't force you. He gives you an invitation. I believe everyone in this room has B.O. Turn to your name and says, man, you have B.O. You guys know what B.O. is, yeah? Okay, this is kingdom B.O. It's a little different. Let me tell you what B.O. is. Boldness and obedience. When you got born again, he gave you boldness and obedience, which means nothing is a hindrance anymore for you. Everything you have is everything you need. This is how it works. Your left leg's boldness, right leg's obedience. I see a person in the street and I apply my B.O. to G.O. Boldness, obedience. Boldness, obedience. Does God do it for me? No, he doesn't lift me up supernaturally and take me over. I apply it. Boldness, obedience. I'm faced with a person and then I share. But I don't know what to share. Then just read the card. But I've never prayed for the sick. Then just read the card. I've never heard a word of knowledge. Just read the card. It's the gospel. It's enough to change your life. Yeah. Don't worry about the rest. That will come as you go. Yeah, yeah. Jesus at the door is a garden where all your other gifts can grow. But you don't need it to begin. Every single one of you guys, maybe you've been told, you've looked at others, the professionals, and you've said, man, I can never do that. I've got some good news for you. You can do this. The Holy Spirit is your captain, and he will lead you every step of the way. It's like a tandem bicycle. He's at the front, captain. Captain has two jobs, true story. Two jobs, uh, sorry, hold the bicycle upright and navigate, that's it. The one at the back has one job. It's called the stoker. Pedal. You're the stoker, he's the captain. And every day when you get out of your bed, this is what he's saying, okay? It's another day. I'm ready. Are you ready? Let's do this. Let's go and change Everett. Because he's ready for it. He's only waiting on you. You see, tandem bicycles, there's, there's one little kind of uh, problem that they have. is like a, a, a handicap. They don't go until the one at the back starts going. You can have the best captain, and you've got him, believe me. But until you start pedaling, that bike ain't moving. How do you ride a bicycle? You go left, right, left, right. You go boldness, obedience, boldness, obedience. And you just keep pedaling and keep pedaling and keep pedaling. And before you know it, you're going to forget you're even pedaling. Because you're going to be enjoying the view so much. You're going to be enjoying the adventure that you're not even realizing that your boldness and obedience is taking you where you need to get to because you're just enjoying the ride. And as you spend time with the Spirit in that way, you're going to have fun. You're going to get to know Him. You're going to get to know his voice. You're going to get to know how he thinks and feels about people. You're just going to flow effortlessly and effortlessly. And then it's going to get to a point where you realize, man, I don't need to be with my hat on, evangelism hat, clocking in one hour window to strike. You're going to be realizing, man, I can do this everywhere. I can do it even with sweaty, hairy people in the gym. I can go to people's front doors, about to have it slammed in my face, and things can still happen. That's the power of the gospel. But where do you go? Do you argue? Do you debate? No, you find out where your captain's stopping. So excuse me. Can I? No, I'm not interested, man. No problem. God bless you. Have a great day. I guess my captain's not stopping there. I'm just following. Where's my captain stopping? Is he stopping here? Cool. Let's stay here for a little while. Maybe he, no, this guy's not really interested, actually. Let's carry on. And we just follow the captain all the way, every day, every step. He's going to lead you all the time. It's beautiful. It's easy. It's simple. And everybody can do it. You see, the Holy Spirit showed me that everyone's the apple of his eye. Just like this apple here. That was you on a tree until somebody caught you. In Deuteronomy 32.10 and Zechariah 2.8, Psalm 17.8 says, we're the apple of his eye. What that means is that you're his favorite. If you're his favorite, then so are they out there. We're all the apple of his eye. 
And the difference between you and them is this. Somebody caught you. So I'm going to tell you what he wants you to do. He wants you to walk through the apple orchards of life every single day. Wherever environment, whatever sphere of life he's put you in. Because you remember that he knew where you were going to be born. He knew where you were going to live. Where you were going to die. He knew every little thing about you. And he's placed you somewhere. So you can influence people I'll never meet. Or you can influence people that Pastor John will never meet. Because that's where he's put you. In a sphere of influence. Are you going to be prepared to give hope, uh, answer to the hope that's inside you? All he wants you to do is this. Reach out your hand and be willing to catch. That's it. That's what evangelism is. Walking through the apple orchards every day of your life, reaching out your hand and being willing to catch. You see, because if apples fall with nobody to catch them, they die, just like this one. They blacken, they rot, and they die. And there's too many people dying because our hands are too busy in buildings, in the air, singing songs. And where our hands need to be after we sing these songs with our hands in the air, giving the praise that he deserves, we need to give him more praise. And we need to give him more praise, the sacrifice of praise, by taking those hands that have been praising and getting them outside the building and reaching out and trying to catch some apples before they die, before they fall to the ground. That's the kind of praise he's looking for. I believe it with my whole heart. Man, I've never felt the presence of God more than when I am stepping out into a situation that's out of my control and out of my depth to share this wonderful gospel. I've never felt the favor of God or his smile upon me. Those who win souls are wise. I'm going to tell you, his face will shine upon you as you step out with this gospel in a mission to save lives. Not in a mission to pat yourself on the back or to get some kind of fame. But as you step out and say, God, my heart breaks for the one. My heart breaks for those apples that have fallen and and are going to hell. Those people who don't even know you. My heart's breaking. And because you hung on a cross so that they wouldn't have to do that, I need to do something about it. I need to make a difference. When you go with that motive, he will breathe on you and things will begin to happen. Will you step out for him? Will you even give him 20 seconds? I was at the gym in my community, and I'll end with this. Northern Ireland, I was there, and I began a new believer group. Some in, uh, notorious individuals were at it, but were, I began to make this little hit list, yeah? I'm like, I want him, I want him, because I began to hear who the most individual uh, gatekeepers were in my community, and I'm like, I'm coming for them. My church had been there for 15 years, and then my pastor said this to me. He said, there is a demographic our church has never reached. He said, look around, we have a middle-class church. He said, there's a demographic we've never reached. The church had been there for 15 years, made a dominant presence in the community through healing and different things. But there was a a group of people who never even heard. Never even heard the gospel. Because you see, when these people came down the street, people crossed the other side. But I didn't want to cross to the other side. I wanted to catch those apples. So I I began to lead some of these guys to the Lord, some notorious individuals. One guy did 21 years for murder. He was in our home. It became part of our family. I've got an amazing picture where he's there eating ice cream with my daughter on a Sunday afternoon beach walk. Because we don't just lead them to the Lord and say, have a nice life. They become part of our family. We've seen over 300 people become part of our family just by loving them. So I'm in the gym and I'd heard about this guy, uh, this, this really well-known guy called Ryan, who was very uh, notorious and very violent. I'm like, I really want to get to that guy, man. So one day I'm in the gym and there he is. So he was like closed off and shut down. So I went to another guy who's his friend who's a well-known boxer. And I went and shared the gospel with his friend and I'm really just trying to get to Ryan. And, uh, <laughs> and, and he's kind of like, you know, I know he's listening, but he's not looking. I go home that night and something happens. He messages me on Facebook. He says, I respect you. And I want this Jesus. What did I do? I did nothing. Nothing apart from open my mouth and release the gospel into the air. Because that's the power it has. It's crazy. You know what happened? He messages me. I say, okay, come to my home. If you're serious, come to my home. He's like, okay, because my home is where the group is. Come to my home. Yeah, man, I'll come, I'll come. Now, I knew from Tuesday... Uh, to Thursday, those two days, I knew the devil fights dirty and he's going to throw whatever he can at my friend. So I had to strike now. So I say, okay, this is what we're going to do. Go into a room and for 28 minutes, 28 minutes, I'm going to send you a documentary. It's called The Cross by Billy Graham. Go and shut the door, sit in a room and watch it and then come back and tell me. 30 minutes later, he comes back. He says on Facebook, what was that? 
I did what you said. I went in a room, I closed my eyes, and I began to weep after, after I watched it. I said, that's Jesus, the same Jesus you're going to meet when you come to my home. So for four weeks, I prayed him in. Lord, bring him. Lord, bring him. And I kept inviting him, and he kept making excuses. Week number four, I'm in the kitchen with my wife. I'm like, Ryan's coming today. She says, you keep saying that for the past four weeks. I'm like, yeah, but tonight he's coming. And soon enough, in he comes with the boxer and with these other two people. And he makes his presence known because he's enigmatic, big personality. Everybody loves him. And he bounces in 19 years of age. And I said to everybody, make your way into the living room. We're going to do things a little different tonight. We know we had a little plan. Scrap everything. I'm going to make the most of this. So we go into the living room. I said, okay, this is what's going to happen. Everybody sit down. I'm going to share the gospel. And you're going to respond. So that's what I did. I shared the gospel. Five minutes. If you want Jesus and you feel him in this room right now, you stand to your feet. Forget who's next to you. But if you want him, you stand to your feet. You're going all in. You're giving everything. Do you want him? Ryan's the first to his feet. And as he stands, he begins to weep as the power of God touches him. And then the boxer stands, and then the other two stand. It was like the book of Acts. I'm going to tell you what happened with that young man. That young man had bullet holes shot in his windows previously. That's the kind of gangster lifestyle he was in. You can still see the bullet holes in the wall and in the, in the windows. He had bullet holes shot. He had a death threat from the paramilitaries against him. He was moving lots of drugs. He was a very violent lad. He grew up in children's homes, young offenders prison, into adult prison when he was 18. Very well known for his fists, very violent, fierce reputation. He gets saved, and I began to disciple him, and he begins to lead others to the Lord. And then fast forward um, about six months, this is what happens. He, gets, uh, he goes to court for a crime he committed a month before he got saved. He stands before the judge, and his barrister said, you're going to jail, there's no way around it. So we write him a reference and he stands before the, the, the judge. This is what the judge says. The judge reads the reference and he hears other things, uh, other references from the community. He said, young man, if I could step down from here and shake your hand, I would. Because seldom have I seen such a transformation in a young man like I've seen in you. And he was acquitted. This made it into the local newspaper. This guy was notorious. In the local newspaper... And we put that local newspaper clip up on our screen on a Sunday morning and celebrated what the gospel can do. Isn't that incredible? A few months later, our school of ministry guys were, were around the town and a police officer stopped them. He said, are you, this, are you the church responsible for Ryan Lennon? They said, yeah, yeah. He said, well, I just want to tell you, the whole police service in Northern Ireland is talking about the change in that one young man. Can we give you a list of names? Ryan, a year, uh, two years ago, Ryan was employed as a staff member in my church. He never worked. He was a criminal. He's been on staff for almost two years at my church. I got to marry him and various other things. But I'm going to tell you how it begins. I don't know how it's going to look because I'm not the captain. But all I know is if I move and if I apply my BO to GO, then something's going to happen. I don't know what it is. I don't know how it's going to look, but I know something's going to happen. You see, the gospel is like a sledgehammer. Yeah. And when you apply a sledgehammer to a surface, something cracks. Yeah. But many of us are using the gospel like, like a feather, trying to tickle people's ears. It's not an ear tickler. It's a wall smasher. Yeah. And it will smash the wall around their hearts as soon as they hear it. Yeah. That is the power that you wield with the gospel. So my appeal to you this evening is this. Will you rise? Will you stand? I don't care who you are. I don't care what age you are. But will you say to God, God, I'm going to go for you. I'm scared, but I'm, I'm more scared of not obeying you. Because the Great Commission wasn't a suggestion. It was a command. So you're disobeying by not fulfilling this command. And you say, but I don't know how to do it. Well, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to put it in your hand. And you've got no excuses. And these people here, some of these people here will go with you. Okay, so let us pray. Holy Spirit, I ask you, Lord, in this moment that you would rest upon certain individuals. I pray, Lord, that you would stir some of these men and women and children in this room this evening. I believe there are some people in your community that are just waiting for these guys to go to. I believe there's some of you young guys. There's a couple of you, couple of you girls. I believe the Lord's stirring you this evening. 
I feel you've been, uh, you've had some words said against you, like a bullying kind of thing, and it's brought fear to you, it's shut you down. I feel there's one girl in particular who began to share uh, Jesus to her friends, and then the opposition came. The devil brought somebody to, uh, to, to start speaking, speaking the, uh, ill of you, and it knocked your confidence, and you went silent. And I believe this evening, the Lord wants to open your mouth. I believe he wants to put a lioness call inside of you, and he wants to let that roar loose inside of you this evening. If that's you, stand up. I want to pray for you. If you feel that, if you're a young lady and you feel that you've been sharing your faith, God bless you. And the Lord's going to release you. Just some of you guys gather around here and pray for her. In Jesus' name, we break off every bit of fear right now, every word that was spoken over her, every lie in the name of Jesus, we break it off. And I thank you for the fire that she holds, that she has in her heart, Lord. I ask you, Father, that you would release her. And I thank you that there are people set aside for her. I thank you people's lives are going to be changed because of her. And Lord, you're going to release her. So we pray right now, boldness. I release impartation. Everything you put in me, double portion in Jesus' name. I ask you to release it right now, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we break off the lies. We break off the fear. In Jesus' name, release her to be a soul winner without measure. All fear, we smash you right now. We silence you right now in Jesus' name. That voice that has said you're not good. The voice that said you're not beautiful. That voice that has said you're, not, you're ugly, you're no good. We rebuke it right now and send it back to hell. The devil has tried to lie to you. He's tried to lie and say you're no good, you're worth nothing. But I want to tell you right now, you're his princess and he's anointed you. He's anointed you. He says, you go for me, girl. You go for me and watch what I do. So right now in Jesus' name, boldness fall on her. In Jesus' name. Release it, Lord. Boldness upon her in the name of Jesus. More of your presence. More of your power. Release her. Go. Go and do what he's called you to do. No devil will stand in your way. No devil will stop you anymore. In Jesus' name, release her, Lord. Release her for that call in the name of Jesus. Release her. Release her in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Release her. You guys just pray over her. If you're here this evening and you're being stirred because you know God's calling you for more, God bless you. I've, I felt the Lord's hand on your life too. He's going to raise you up. There'll be no more silencing. If you're here and you want to stand and you want to say to God, and don't do it if you don't mean it, please. But if you feel the stirring of the Holy Spirit, and I feel that also there's a couple of guys. I feel that for a couple of guys, you, you're strong on the outside. And people look at you and they're like, man, that guy's got it. You're like strong, you're solid, you're confident. But on the inside, you're nervous. Because you're, you may be strong on the outside, but you're scared to go for Jesus. Because you've got strength in yourself, but you haven't got strength in him. And he wants to say to you right now that I see the little boy in you. And I want to strengthen that little boy in you. Because it's no good being strong if you won't be strong for me. God bless you, sir. If there's anybody else, you stand and you say, look, okay, God, I need to get right with you. And I need to begin to stand for you. I'm sorry when I've been ashamed. I'm sorry that I've been embarrassed. I'm sorry that I've tried to whisper because there's people hearing me. The Lord wants to release a roar inside of you this evening. He wants to release a lion's roar inside of you this evening. You see, the, bold, the righteous are as bold as a lion. And he's going to put a roar inside of you. If that's uh, any, any of you guys at all now, if that's you in any way, if you're here, men, man, woman, child, and you're like, I want to go, I want to go for you, and you just stand to your feet. Thank you, Jesus. If any of the worship guys want to come back, if there is anyone. Holy Spirit, I ask you right now that you rest upon these people. I ask you that you'd fall upon them. I ask you that you'd breathe upon them. Just hold out your hands, guys. Hold out your hands as if to receive. Holy Spirit, would you breathe on them? Breathe on them. I ask you that you would awaken the roar inside of their lives. I ask you as they go home, Lord, that you begin to smash every lie and every stronghold and every wall that has been built up around their hearts to stop them from moving freely. In Jesus' name. You come to the front. If you want to come to the front, we're going to pray for you. Is that cool?